My name is Kevin Vallejo and I'm the North American Commercial Manager for the Radiation Monitors Department at Tracerco. As some of you may already know, Tracerco offers a wide range of radiation monitors and services. Today, Alan Seitz from Alara Consultants will be joining me to speak about Norm, his experience with Norm, and some of the capabilities Alara and Tracerco have to offer. We invite you to ask questions during the course of the presentation in the chat as we'll be having a live Q&A at the end of the presentation. So if you don't mind, may you please place your computers on mute and let's go ahead and get started. Norm may be a health hazard and concern in the workplace during maintenance of process equipment and handling of norm waste. Improper assessment or handling of norm could lead to unnecessary exposures to workers and the general public, the spread of contamination, improper waste collection and disposal, work stoppages, potential legal liabilities, extended turnaround outages, which all can contribute to the increased costs. Alara Consultants has been providing norm support services for plant turnarounds in the petroleum and fertilizer in industry for the past 25 years. Prior to the start of a turnaround, we consult with our clients to evaluate the client's preparedness by reviewing their norm policies and procedures. Using our norm turnaround checklist, we make recommendations to improve their norm management system for the purpose of the turnaround. This checklist was developed to ensure proper planning that will avoid work slowdowns, disruptions, and minimize cost to the client, resulting in a effective management of norm during the turnaround. We have 12 items on our norm turnaround checklist. I'm going to review each one of these in a little more detail in the following slides. Number one, norm training. Norm training should be delivered prior to or at the beginning of the turnaround. Training is a, an essential part of effectively managing norm as it allows the workers to ask questions and helps alleviate concerns or fears about norm that can result in work delays and disruptions. Training enables workers to understand the norm hazards and the real health risks associated with norm, keep their exposures as low as reasonably achievable, protect themselves, other workers, the general public and the environment, and follow and implement the established norm policies and procedures. To satisfy the workers' right to know, employers should ensure workers receive adequate norm training for their role in the turnaround. Training can be delivered as part of a safety meeting in the classroom or even online. Alara has developed online norm training su suitable for norm uh, turnarounds. Norm awareness training is intended for workers who are working at the work sites that encounter norm but do not handle norm directly themselves. It provides an overview of what norm is, how to identify norm areas, norm hazards, and how to protect themselves. Norm worker training is intended for workers who will actually be handling the norm materials and working with or inside norm contaminated equipment. It instructs workers about the health hazards biological effects, risks, PP requirements, and handling procedures. Advanced norm training is intended for the supervisors and the permit issuers who are responsible for organizing and supervising the norm work. Number two, identify norm contaminated equipment via gamma survey. Prior to the start of the turnaround, we can identify potentially norm contaminated process equipment by performing a gamma survey on the external surface of the equipment. At minimum, all the vessels uh, scheduled for confined space entries should be surveyed, as these are likely the higher risk areas. A gamma survey is provided or performed with a calibrated norm meter equipped with a scintillation detector. Any equipment with a distinguishable reading above the ambient background should be flagged as being potentially norm contaminated. Here on the bottom right hand side, you see the intrinsically safe Tracico Norm Monitor IS. It is now connected with a scintillation detector and it's detecting the penetrating gamma rays coming through the uh, process equipment. Three, identify potential norm challenges in scheduled work scope. Prior to the start of the turnaround, the work scope involved in each piece of norm contaminated process equipment that was identified in the gamma survey should be reviewed for the purpose of identifying norm challenges. If removal and disposal of waste materials from process equipment is in the work scope, 
One may need interim on-site storage for the waste as norm analysis is required prior to disposal of that waste. You wanna try and estimate the waste volumes and ensure that you have adequate storage capacity. If possible, collect the samples of the norm waste and have it analyzed prior to the start of the turnaround so the waste can be immediately sent off site for disposal. If removal of parts from inside process equipment is in the work scope, plan how the parts will be handled prior or handled during the removal to limit the spread of contamination and minimize worker exposure. Issues such as interim packaging, cleaning, decontamination, and temporary storage of used contaminated parts should also be assessed. If specialized tools or equipment are required to be used with or inside norm contaminated spaces for repair or inspection purposes, attempt to cover or maybe even bag any specialized and expensive tools to prevent contamination. Decontamination of tools or equipment may be necessary. After removal, plan for a temporary laydown areas for larger tools or equipment until norm surveying is completed. A good example of this is scaffolding taken out of confined space entries. We need to ensure they are not contaminated before we put them back into stock. If there is process equipment, such as valves going offsite for repair, make inquiries to ensure the repair shop accepts and is able to work on norm contaminated equipment. You may need to plan or arrange the transport of this equipment as class seven radioactive dangerous goods. Take into account the duration of the turnaround, the number of workers handling norm, the number of norm confined space entries, and whether you're doing day and night shifts to determine the requirements for norm surveyors who measure norm contamination inside of process equipment. How many of these norm or qualified norm surveyors are required so that the groups of maintenance personnel are not being held up for norm surveying to be completed? Also, norm friskers who check and frisk workers for contamination. How many qualified norm friskers are required to check the workers prior to going on coffee or lunch breaks? We don't want to hold up groups of workers from going on break due, in, due to insufficient number of norm friskers as it takes about three to five minutes to frisk one worker. You may need to stagger breaks due to the size of the workforce or limited number of friskers. Consider hiring norm safety consultants to survey equipment and frisk workers, or even consider training internal personnel to do these tasks. You may need to purchase or rent norm meters. Number four, measure norm contamination inside process equipment. When potentially norm contaminated equipment identified in the gamma survey is opened, the internal surfaces need to be surveyed and measured for surface contamination using a pancake geiger muller detector. So on the right hand side, again, we see the intrinsically safe uh, tricycle norm monitor IS. This time it is connected to a pancake detector. Ensure to survey sufficient amount of equipment surfaces to get a full assessment of the entire piece of process equipment. A good example are towers. If one only surveyed the bottom and middle open manways on a tower and the measurement showed no evidence of norm contamination, one would assume the tower is free of norm contamination. However, if you also surveyed the top manway and now it showed significant amounts of contamination, now we would deem the tower as norm contaminated. Supervisors must ensure a full norm hazard assessment has been completed for each planned work activity before the workers handle norm, dismantle equipment, or enter these confined spaces. Establish a contamination threshold that will be used to deem equipment as norm contaminated based on the surface contaminations inside that equipment. Check your local norm guidelines or regulations for contamination limits. Here in Canada, the, the Canadian guidelines for the management of norm state the alpha beta gamma surface contamination limit is one becquerel per centimeter squared. Determine what meter reading equals that one becquerel per centimeter squared. So your meter might be reading out in counts per minute or counts per second. So how many counts per minute equals one becquerel per centimeter squared? The uh, tricycle norm monitor IS, it actually has that capability of reading out in becquerels per centimeter squared. 
You must have qualified surveyors testing the interior of the equipment for surface contamination. Ensure that they are using the proper norm meter and detector. And again, measuring surface contamination, use that pancake Geiger Mueller detector. When we talk about qualified norm surveyor, this is someone who is trained, experienced, and competent. They must be able to demonstrate the competency in using and reading the norm meter and surveying techniques. CLR's website for online norm meter training uh, for various norm meters, including the Tricycle Norm Monitor IS. Number five, uh, norm ID tags for the process equipment. We recommend attaching the norm ID tags on all equipment identified as potentially norm contaminated. Norm ID tags, they notify the workers that the equipment is potentially contaminated and proper PP is needed prior to handling or opening up that piece of equipment. Once the equipment is opened up and tested for surface contamination, the status of the equipment is marked on the tag. It's either norm free or norm contaminated. These norm ID tags, they stay with that piece of equipment, including equipment going off site for repair like valves or uh, until the equipment is reinstalled or in the case of a confined space, the tag is only removed after that vessel manway is closed. Our norm ID tags that we use, they show only norm free or norm contaminated. We don't recommend displaying the actual contamination measurement in counts per minute or counts per second. Uh, and this is to avoid misinterpretation by the workers. Good example is a thousand counts per minute of surface contamination does not equal the 1,000 microsievert annual dose limit. You need to establish who's responsible for attaching <clears throat> the norm tags to the equipment. Is it the norm surveyor, the plant operator, the permit issuer? The communication though between these parties is required as the surface contamination level will determine the PP requirements and how we're, are we going to handle this process equipment. Norm tags, they should be durable as not to tear off or break off during cleaning or hydroblasting and you want to use strong plastic ties to attach that tag to the equipment. And also use non-erased markers uh, for when we mark the tag as being norm-free or norm-contaminated. Norm tags, they avoid costly mistakes, unnecessary exposures, and work disruptions from workers entering unknown norm vessels or working on equipment without the proper norm PPE. Number six. Establishing and flagging off norm zones. <clears throat> a clearly identified and defined norm zone shows the boundaries of the norm work area, where entry is permitted only by trained workers with the appropriate norm PPE. To identify these norm zones, one can use norm signs or attach these norm ID tags to some caution flagging. You want to limit the size of the flagged off areas to avoid disruptions to other nearby work, we recommend flagging off about two meters from open norm contaminated equipment. You want to consult with workers uh, when the flagged off area or zone is reduced or enlarged in size to avoid any worker confusion or concerns the workers may have. You want to frisk workers and hand tools for norm contamination before they leave the norm zone. You want to seal op uh, and tag contaminated equipment before you removal from the norm zone, and continuously collect and dispose of any loose norm debris like sludges or polymers that come from inside of the equipment to prevent the spread of contamination outside that flag norm zone. Number seven, let's talk about norm change tents. The purpose of norm change tents is to have a designated areas for the workers to don, remove, and dispose of their PP and to frisk the workers for contamination. Construction and design of these norm change tents or areas can vary and they are not intended to be airtight enclosures. They can be as simple as a flagged off area, but the design should include a connected clean zone and a dirty, dirty zone, each with a separate entrance. Have someone assigned to equip these norm change tents uh, with extra PP, respirator wipes, cleaning supplies, waste containers. You wanna keep these norm change tents organized and perform regular housekeeping to minimize the spread and accumulation of norm. 
So I would expect to see some contamination on the dirty side, but never on the clean side. So what we're gonna do day to day is clean up any small accumulation of norm on the dirty side so it doesn't spread to that clean side. As far as location of these norm change tents, here in the uh, slide, we see three norm zones. Two are located at the base or the tower, uh, base of the foot of the tower, and the third one is actually a confined space on the tower itself. All three norm zones, they're going to use one centrally located norm change tent. As far as the procedure of these norm change tents, workers would leave the norm zone or the confined space and they would head straight over to that norm change tent. The norm frisker is called uh, to meet the workers at the change tent. The workers enter the dirty side. Prior to removing their PP, the norm frisker frisks the, uh, the worker for contamination from head to toe in order to identify any norm contaminated PP, street clothing, or the skin. The worker removes his PP starting with his hard hat, remove his harness if he's wearing one, hooded coveralls, gloves, etc. The norm contaminated PP is segregated from non contaminated PP to reduce the amount of generated waste and to reduce disposal costs. They're going to put the PP into the labeled waste containers. Workers, they now remove their rubber boots and they step onto a buffer pad. And then they would step into the clean side where they would don their leather boots. We'd allow the hard hats and the respirator to be taken to the clean side if it's free of norm contamination. And we just reverse that order when the worker returns from his break and goes back to work. Number eight, frisking workers and tools for contamination. Tools and workers, they should be checked for norm contamination after working on norm contaminated equipment and before they leave these norm areas. Identifying contamination on workers and PP and tools will mitigate the spread of contamination and also accidental ingestion of norm, where if they have it on their hands and they go to eat, they may get it inside their mouth. Frisking workers involves systematically scanning workers' exposed skin, exposed skin, uh, street clothing, gloves, coveralls, their footwear, and remaining PP. As I stated before, it takes about three to five minutes to do, to do a full frisk on a worker. You must have qualified and trained norm friskers that are competent and familiar with the norm meters and frisking techniques. Again, you're going to use that pancake GM detector to perform that frisking of workers and ensure that pancake is just about touching the uh, PP when he's performing the, the frisking. So at least a half a centimeter away from the PP. Decontamination of PP and workers. Yes, it is possible to decontaminate PP simply with a wet rag. Respirator wipes work well on hard hats or maybe even use duct tape to lift contamination off fire retardant coveralls. PPE free of norm contamination is allowed for unrestricted disposal or recycle. You do not send contaminated fire retardant coveralls off-site for commercial laundering. On-site laundering is permitted if you're washing these items separate from other clothing and the washing machine is checked for contamination after you complete the washing. I've never found a our washing machine contaminated after we wash uh, contaminated coveralls. You can accumulate large volumes of PP during a turnaround. And this is why we want to segregate the contaminated PP from non-contaminated PP to reduce disposal costs. When a worker's skin is found contaminated, it should be reported to the supervisor who should oversee the decontamination of the worker's skin and document that incident. Decontamination is usually successful by repeat washing with lukewarm water and mild soap. The goal for decontamination of worker skin is background, not the equipment uh, contamination surface limit of that one becquerel per centimeter squared. Usually that one becquerel per centimeter squared is probably three or four times background. Very unlikely that shower facilities would be needed for decontamination of workers if proper PP is used. Number 10, norm PP requirements. Workers can receive an external gamma radiation exposure from norm inside of equipment. This is what we're seeing on the left-hand side here. The worker 
that standing by that enclosed pipe. There are those penetrating gamma rays coming through the equipment. He is not getting contaminated, but he is receiving a gamma exposure from the external gamma radiation. So PPE does not protect from external gamma exposures. We can reduce our external gamma exposures by reducing our exposure time, increase your distance between yourself and the source of the radiation. And in most cases, the external gamma exposures are insignificant due to the low environmental gamma levels. However, in some cases, we may see elevated gamma levels where you may want to measure and record those gamma exposures uh, to workers. And you can do this by using these personal electronic dissimilars. And so here in the picture on the slide, we see the Traceco intrinsically safe uh, PED, personal electronic dissimilar dash IS, it's intrinsically safe. The highest risk of receiving a radiation dose is actually from the internal norm exposures that we might get through inhalation, ingestion, or absorption through open cuts or wounds. PP will prevent or at least minimize these internal exposures. Sources of internal radiation exposures are airborne contamination, surface contamination, or personal contamination. This is where we actually get it on our skin. And workers can unknowingly carry contamination on them to other areas. Hence, we need to check workers for contamination before they leave these work areas. We can mitigate workers' internal exposures and skin and clothing contamination with personal protective equipment. Respiratory protection is the most effective and the most important piece of PPE. We can prevent inhalation and also accidental ingestion by donning respiratory protection, such as supplied air. We need to wear supplied air if radioactive radon gas is present in that environment. Or we can use the half or full face respirators equipped with these HEPA P100 cartridges if radon gas is not present. Also, we can prevent the contamination uh, of workers' skin and clothing by wearing protective coveralls, uh, gloves, and rubber boots. You may want to standardize your PP requirements, and this is what we tend to do in our turnarounds. Uh, when we are working outside of a norm zone, there is no additional PPE required except for your standard worksite PPE. If you are working though within a norm zone, you are required to wear a half or a full face respirator equipped with those P100 cartridges. Uh, the worker may also require disposable coveralls if making physical contact with any norm contaminated surface. The third situation would be when you're working inside norm contaminated process equipment or doing a confined space entry. The required PP is dependent on the work environment, and there may be a variation of that PP depending on the work activity, the work scope, the confined space uh, environment. Is it dry or is it wet environment? Is it low contamination versus high contamination, contamination surface levels? So if you're working in a dry environment, chances are you probably only be required to wear hooded disposable Tyvek coveralls over your fire retardant coveralls. If you're going inside of tanks, washing out tanks where it's in a wet environment, you probably would be better off wearing rain gear. Or maybe chemical suits or doubling up on coveralls if you are working on high surface contamination levels. Gloves, a good pair of leather gloves provides you with a high level of protection. But again, if you're going into wet environments, I would recommend wearing rubber, rubber gloves. If you need that dexterity, handling small items like bolts, equipment, you may want to wear latex gloves. As far as boots, footwear protection, rubber boots uh, are by far uh, the best, I think. Uh, they're easy to take on and put on. Um, they're uh, easy to decontaminate. You, wear, you can wear booties over top of your leather boots. However, I do caution on the slip hazard. And also these booties, they tend to tear fairly easy, which could result in contaminating those leather boots. So again, I like when guys wear the rubber boots. As far as respiratory protection, it's either a half mask respirator, but now that we're going inside of confined space, we want to protect our eyes, okay? And so then we need to wear goggles with that half mask respirator. 
or if you just wear a full face respirator, both of those respirators need to be uh, equipped with those P100 cartridges, or you could use the supplied air. A few comments about Norm PP. The permit issuer or the supervisor should make the risk assessment and determine what is the best and suitable PPE based on the nature of the work and the climate conditions. Permit issuers should try and be consistent with PP requirements to avoid worker confusion and clearly identify the PP requirements on the work permit, what they need to wear. PP requirements may change as conditions change and should be reviewed with the workers to explain the rationale for that change. Workers should re request clarification of uh, PP requirements if in doubt, and they also need to inspect their PP before they use and don the PP. PPE issues that may arise or cause work disruptions. Ensure the workers are fit tested for the respirators prior to the start of the turnaround or maybe provide on-site testing. Ensure adequate supply and sizes of respirators and replacement P100 cartridges. Instruct the workers they do not need to change those cartridges after every confined space entry or after every shift. They can wear them for multiple days. Ensure there's adequate supply and sizes of coveralls, boots, and gloves. As far as proper radiation hygiene, to avoid that accidental ingestion of norm, we practice proper radiation hygiene. No eating, drinking, or smoking in norm areas. And workers, they need to wash their hands and face after working in norm zones and before going on break where they may have a drink, handle food, or have a cigarette. Number 11, norm contamination control measures. In industrial environments, the expectation is contamination control, not elimination. You want to limit or contain that norm contamination inside established norm zones. As much as possible, contain the, the norm waste materials when cleaning process equipment to prevent the spread of contamination outside of that norm zone. In this picture below here, we see that Water is introduced at one end and is being pushed through these plugged metal tubes and the water will exit at the other end where a hoarding was built to prevent the spraying of water. The only thing I would add in this picture would be to have the hoarding built inside that tub to prevent ground contamination. So spending the time to build containment versus decontamination is time well spent and better cost saving in the long run. Norm de debris should be collected and placed in designated norm waste containers. You want a continuous housekeeping of these areas and norm surveying will avoid the spread and accumulation of norm. Sealing open ports of norm contaminated equipment with plastic and duct tape prevents the spread of contamination and mitigates the exposure to the workers. After sealing the equipment, now it's an enclosed system again, respiratory protection is no longer required and the norm flagging can be removed if no other norm hazard exists. I would recommend you make sealing open ends of norm contaminated equipment a standard practice. Number 12, norm waste. You want to minimize the amount of norm waste by segregating norm waste from non-norm waste which will also reduce our disposal costs. Usually the most eff cost effective time to segregate waste is at the initial handling of the waste. Ideally, you want to handle, collect and store the norm waste only once. Improper collection of waste will require resurveying of that waste and resorting of that waste at a later date. And this could lead to the spread of contamination, unnecessary worker exposure and add to the cost of the turnaround. Ensure that you have adequate number and suitable waste containers, such as open or closed rig tanks for the storage of sludges and liquids, <clears throat> and also industrial grade bags and drums for short and long term storage. The Canadian guidelines for the management of norm, they categorize norm waste as either diffuse waste or discrete waste. Diffuse waste is like scales, sludges, and liquids. Okay, anything we can put into a slurry. The end method of disposal is usually in underground salt caverns, abandoned wells or injection wells. 
The other type of waste, discrete waste, is contaminated equipment, like personal protective equipment, maybe tarps or filters. The end method for disposal are usually norm approved landfills or decontamination facilities. So we want to segregate the diffuse from the discrete waste as each have different disposal methods and different release limits. Norm waste should be properly stored from the initial collection until transport to final disposal. You want to maintain up-to-date uh, inventory of your norm waste and periodically confirm the inventory. Waste containers, they should be properly labeled and periodically inspected to ensure containment integrity. Approved norm disposal facilities, they require norm analysis documentation of the waste prior to the scheduled delivery. So samples of that norm waste, they need to be collected and sent to an approved laboratory for norm analysis. If possible, collect the uh, samples before sealing the norm waste containers for interim and long-term storage. That's the end of my presentation. And now Kevin from Tracico will be providing you with information on the Tracico monitors. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Alan. Alrighty. Alrighty, so, so the fires are hazard in many industries. Sometimes the hazard is quite evident as when flammable gases like hydrogen or propane are being handled, but in other situations, it's a lot less obvious. For an example, dust can be highly combustible. A fire needs fuel, oxygen, and an ignition source. Flammable gases, vapors, and dust provide fuel. Oxygen is present in most environments, and ignition can come from a spark or a hot surface. As, any as you guys may already know, any fire is dangerous, but in more extreme cases, combustion is so rapid which can cause an explosion. Preventing fires and explosion is a top priority, as no business or organization would wish to be responsible for causing death or injury to any employee which is why the intrinsically safe monitors were introduced into the market to begin with. Intrinsically safe monitors allow for safe operation in hazardous areas where flammable gases, combustible dust, and fibers are present. They are designed to limit the electrical and thermal energy available for ignition. Most equipment in the industrial market are at risk for internal sparks, overheating, and short circuiting, so controlling the internal temperatures and simplifying the circuit by adjusting the components is a must in order to protect workers from a variety of threats. Intrinsically safe monitors are usually used in refineries and chemical plants, and having an intrinsically safe monitor would eliminate the need for a hot work permit, permit which would save you money and time. All of our radiation monitors are ATEC certified and zero zone approved for explosive atmospheres. And actually in the 1970s, we traced to go we're actually the world's first organization to successfully launch and introduce the very first intrinsically safe radiation monitor to the globe. So Tracerco offers a wide range of radiation monitors to measure radiation dose rate or monitor process and environmental contaminants in a number of applications. Radiation monitors play a vital role in radiological protection and the capability to act quickly and safely to incidents in dangerous and hazardous environments is extremely important for anyone being potentially exposed to radiation. It's essential that personnel are equipped with the correct radiation monitoring equipment to ensure that any radiological hazard is detected and any exposure to radiation is monitored carefully. Selecting the appropriate radiation equipment for your specific application needs to carefully be chosen as the type of instrument and detector you're going to be utilizing needs to match that of the radiation you're going to be potentially exposed to. Here I'll be speaking to you about three widely held radiation monitors, which are the Tracerco contamination monitor, the dose rate monitor, and the intrinsically safe personal dose emitter used in the norm industry. Working with unsealed radioactive materials carries the risk of contamination. Contamination monitors enable the operator to confidently detect and quantify contamination arising from NORM under most environmental conditions. Our NORM kit provide, is provided as a single data processing unit and has the choice of two types of radiation detection probes. The Geiger-Muller GM pancake and the scintillator-based probe will detect the presence of any NORM, um, any norm available. There can be significant variations in the de in detection sensitivity from different scale types. 
The norm kit can detect wet and dry norm in a variety of situations. The following table below provides guidance on the selection of probes for particular norm measurement applications. The, the GM probe is perfect for alpha and beta measurements and measures in counts per second or counts per minute and Becquerel per centimeter squared. The scintillator probe is extremely sensitive to gamma radiation and has the ability to undertake surveys of external walls and measure norm in low diameter tubular internals and, and it has a 360 degree response. The operator should always observe the local operating procedures and where appropriate, seek confirmation from the appointed RPS or RPA. The scintillator probe can also be used to locate the radioactive source as the contamination monitor is used to identify leaking radioactive sources as well as to check for contamination on persons exiting contaminated areas. Survey meters are mainly used when workers enter into areas where radioactive materials are stored or used. The monitor measures radiation dose rates and accumulated dose, thus helping the user identify possible health risks and demonstrate regulatory compliance. They are also used to look for the existence of unexpected radioactive materials and to check for leaks in radioactive shielding. The survey monitor has the capability of detecting X-ray and gamma radiation measures in real time and uses Geiger-Muller technology to measure in microsieverts per hour or millirem per hour. Next slide. The PEDs deliver exceptional performance across a wide range of environments and applications. Tracegos designed the PEDs to be the easiest personal radiation monitors to use and understand in the market today. Everything on the devices has been designed with the user in mind. The display system features radiation graph measurements and a simple diagram of a person that fills in with color according to the radiation, the dose of radiation received. All of our PEDs include weather, shock, and drop proof housing in a smooth, clean design and a simple to use dose vision software. Tracego's range of PEDs are suitable for the oil and gas industries, medical and life sciences, nuclear, CBR and emergency services, the NDT market, manufacturing and industrial, and environmental and waste management industries. We offer both intrinsically safe and non-intrinsically safe options for everybody's needs. The PEDIS is an intrinsically safe personal dosimeter, which is perfect for both radiation specialists and those who do not work with radiation on a daily basis. It is safe to use in potentially explosive environments and is robust and reliable, making it ideal for challenging conditions. Since it is intrinsically safe, there is no need for a hot work permit, and the PEDIS is very flexible as you can choose from three radiation measurement modes and four different radiation alarm settings. I want to thank everybody for tuning in today. The team and I really pre appreciate your support. Now we'll go ahead and move on and start answering your questions. If you've not answered a question, if you've not submitted your question yet, we invite you to please participate in the live Q&A. All right, so uh, Alan, so the first question is regarding the respirator. In some workplace conditions, for example, um, in humidity and in heat, it's very hard to keep it for a few hours. So do you recommend to use an alternative equipment? If so, which one can be used? Also, if not, how many hours um, is the maximum that the uh, the norm workers can keep utilizing the uh, uh, the respirator? Um, unfortunately, um, we don't really have an alternative. Uh, I understand when the guys are wearing the half mask or the full face mask, uh, the humidity being an issue, uh, then you may want to consider wearing the supplied air where it tends to keep the guys a little bit cooler. As far as how many hours uh, they can use these uh, masks, um, that would be something I guess you'd have to look into your local occupational safety regulations or guidelines. I, I don't know if there is anything stating that uh, how many hours you know that you can wear a respirator, I really don't have a good answer for that, unfortunately. 
but the humidity definitely wearing the supplied air would, would help. Okay, next question. So during confined space entry, oftentimes air moves air movers are in place. What cost effective filtration equipment can be tied into the air mover externally so you don't so you do not contaminate the entire site or local uh, environment? Okay, you can uh, purchase uh, HEPA filters. Uh, they're really no different than your cartridge that you would be wearing on your respirator. They're just larger in, in size, so that they're industrial. Um, it's, but it, it's, Hello, Alan. Uh, what's that? Uh, sorry, I kind of lost you there. Am I back? Yeah, you're back. Okay. Um, yeah, as far as the air movers. Um, so did you hear my answer about the HEPA filters, Kevin? Yeah, I, uh, I did, but I, I lost. Okay, so um, but we've uh, often we hook up uh, air movers on towers. Um, and we haven't really seen any significant, even measurable amount of contamination coming out of these towers from these air movers. Uh, we, what we do is we put duct tape on the uh, air mover horn and with the sticky side, so the air would be blowing against that sticky side on the, the duct tape. And seldom have we any seen any um, contamination being blown out. Uh, the other thing what you wanna do is wherever the exhaust is, on that air mover, you want to make that a norm zone so people are not in that area. And when it's being blown out into the air, basically what is happening is dilution is happening. So any small particles, uh, they're just being diluted by the ambient air. So uh, in regards to disposal, what would the risk be on dispo on the disposing of norm contaminated equipment such as tubulars and abandoned oil and gas wells? Well, the risk there would be uh, now we usually what they'll do is they'll put they'll take the scale from tubulars and they may put them down hole, okay? Uh, but in Alberta, for example, you would have to get permission and make a plan to the Alberta government, I'll just say it's the government, um, on what your disposal method is. And as far as the risk, it really depends on the well itself, I, I would think. Um, unfortunately, I'm probably not the best one on telling you what the potential risk is, but it would be leakage into the groundwater is what I would be mostly concerned of. Right, so let me go on to the next question. Bear with me one moment. So, uh, one becquerel per centimeter squared is it says it's quite low and requires sufficient pulses to be counted um, to limit confidence intervals and get reliable readings. Any recommendations on counted pulses, readings, or integration time settings? Yes, uh, sorry, did they say 200 counts per minute? Is that what they said? It said one becquerel squared, oh, one, uh, becquerel. Per, one becquerel per centimeter squared. Okay, so one becquerel per centimeter squared, yeah. Um, so by taking the longer time count, uh, statistically, you're gonna get a more accurate number. And so what we tend to do is when we're in doubt, uh, it, what we tend to find is either it's, it's easily norm contaminated or it's not norm contaminated. So we're not really getting around that one becquerel per centimeter squared. We're measuring, you know, three or four or five becquerels per centimeter squared. But when you are just getting on that borderline, what I would do is a minimum uh, one minute count. And actually, you may want to go to a five minute count period uh, to give you a better uh, accuracy and confidence in that contamination level. And you want to check a number of areas inside or on that surface. So remember, it's one becquerel per centimeter squared, averaged over 100 squared centimeters. Do a, a number of counts and probably do from one to five minute time count. The next question would be, what are the most common reasons for work stoppages? 
I would say there's probably two of them. Uh, workers uh, have not been trained uh, prior to the turnaround, and there is a level of fear of working with uh, norm. Um, so when they think about norm, all they see is the word radiation, and there is a bit of a fear factor there. Um, with the training, uh, I think it's very important to uh, deliver training as it gives them a real understanding of what the real hazards are associated with norm. And it provides the workers the opportunities to ask questions uh, of their concerns, okay? And it's also important that you relate radiation dose. They're always asking, how much of a radiation dose am I going to get? And what is the annual dose limit? And so you can tell them, oh, the annual dose limit is 1,000 microsieverts. All they really hear is 1,000, and 1,000 is a big number to most people. Uh, when they ask, well, what kind of a radiation dose uh, do, should I expect in this turnaround? And it might be 10 microsieverts, okay? But even 10, they say, well, they feel 10 is a big number. But if you said to them, it would be the equivalent of one dental x-ray. This is something they can relate to that they do on a regular basis. They go to the dentist and they actually get four dental x-rays. And so when you relate it to an activity that they do, one dental x-ray or the equivalent of one chest x-ray, being about 100 microsieverts, uh, that is more of an understanding of, of what the hazards are with norm. Now the other time uh, for common work stoppages or reasons for work stoppages is when a worker has mistakenly worked on a piece of equipment that uh, was not identified as being norm contaminated and they weren't wearing personal protective equipment, okay? Um, then again, the worker wants to know, well, what was my radiation dose? Uh, a good norm surveyor, you should be able to take some readings on the inside or on that piece of equipment and give them an estimate, okay? Um, and again, using that, you would have gotten less than the equivalent of one chest x-ray. So lack of training and a lack of surveying and flagging of equipment or tagging of equipment. I would say that's probably the most common for work stoppages. Okay. Uh, do tools often get contaminated where decontamination is not possible? And can a tool still be utilized when it is norm contaminated? Okay, when it comes to tools, uh, steel tools are usually easier to decontaminate um, as compared to uh, tools that are either wood handles, rubber handles, or maybe even plastic flashlights that go into confined spaces. Uh, so rubber and plastic and uh, wood is difficult to decontaminate. As far as can they keep on using uh, these norm contaminated tools, definitely. We always uh, tell them these are norm contaminated. We're going to tag them as norm contaminated. We're going to put them into a bag. Um, but when you need another uh, hammer uh, to go inside of a norm con confined space, you're going to use this hammer because it is already norm contaminated. And then they'd be wearing appropriate PP, and they, that's when they would use that same hammer. And then once they're done with it, again, they can put it into that bag and uh, reuse it the next time they need to use a hammer inside that confined space. Okay, another question. So, Alan, do you have any experience where radon 222 is an issue without the presence of gas? Uh, and is it measured? Without the presence of gas? Um, So in the oil and gas industry, um, the time you're going to have radon gas is in the oil processing or production side, not the gas processing side. Say this uh, when we're in turnarounds. So in the oil and gas, uh, or, or sorry, in, in, the, in the oil processing side, if you're going to have contaminated sludge, for example, inside of a produced water tank, it's going to have radium-226 Radium-226 always decays down into radon gas. And so when the workers go in there, we know there's going to be radon gas there. And so they are going to have to wear supplied air. And the reason why there's radon gas there, 
Uh, radium-226 is the parent radium nuclide. It's always decaying down into radon gas. Um, in the gas processing side, if when we're having turnarounds there, we're going into vessels, we would void the product, okay? Uh, and they usually uh, put some air movers on it. Uh, for uh, If you do that for at least four hours, that radon gas is no longer there. And so uh, you wouldn't have to measure for it. Um, measuring for radon gas, um, especially in the petroleum industry, is difficult for one reason is that we do not have intrinsically safe radon monitors, okay? And so you'd have to do the gas monitor, monitoring to measure radon gas. Um, I can't say we've taken a lot of radon gas measurements. In fact, very few. Uh, we just go by the fact of the knowledge I just shared you when there should be radon gas or there isn't. And when there is radon gas, like going inside of those confined spaces with the sludges, you weren't supplied air anyway uh, because of the benzene or maybe the H2S factors. Um, okay, and uh, Alan, the, uh, the last question. Um, that we have time for. So how much radiation exposure does a norm worker get from working inside of a norm contaminated vessel? OK, um, you shouldn't be getting much at all. Uh, so remember, the uh, exposure entries are both the it's an internal or the external exposure, right? So the external gamma external exposures from the gamma radiation. Uh, we can measure that uh, with uh, radiation dosimeters. Or we can take a measurement inside and say, oh, it's reading one microsievert per hour. If the guy's inside of that tank for the full day, so in eight hours, if it's one microsievert per hour, he would get eight microsieverts radiation dose. So we could definitely tell him, oh, this is your external gamma exposure. As far as the internal exposure, it should be next to nil uh, for the fact that he is wearing either supplied air or uh, full or half-face respirators with the HEPA cartridge. If we don't get any radioactivity inside the body through ingestion or in inhalation, really the exposure should be next to nil. Uh, and so the average turnaround, I tell people, you know what, I doubt if you're going to get more than 10 microsieverts, equivalent of one dental x-ray. Okay, well, uh, if we have not answered your uh, your questions, please feel free to email either Alan or myself. Uh, our emails are included into the chat. Uh, also, we will be answering your questions uh, individually, so we'll be getting back to uh, all of you. Uh, again, we really pre appreciate your support, and thank you all for tuning in today. Uh, and again, if you have any questions, just feel free to email myself or Alan.